Hi everyone! In this video, I'll be showing you how I recreated a carbon filament light bulb, the first type of electric lighting that actually made it out of the lab and into people's homes. There are two people that typically get credit for this invention, depending on what part of the world you're in. The American inventor Thomas Edison, or the English inventor Joseph Swan. Both of these people announced their invention of the electric light bulb within months of each other, Joseph Swan being the first. However, even though Swan made his announcement first, I believe Edison light bulbs were a more complete and viable invention, for reasons that I'll dig into as we actually make one. I have to make a quick note about Thomas Edison before we get deeper into this video. It's very popular right now to claim that Edison was a fraud and a thief of other people's ideas. This video is not meant to address that issue, but I will say that having now spent more than a year researching him and the people that worked for him, the truth is not that simple. Edison was a very intelligent person, especially in the field of manufacturing. One reason many people now discredit him is because they don't like that he hired other brilliant people to work for him, and so why should Edison get credit for their work? You can look at it that way, but also consider that without Edison, this team of people would not have come together and worked with their combined skills on the inventions Edison believed to be possible. It's complicated, as are all the other rumors and bits of propaganda surrounding him. So let's try to stay humble in our opinions. Okay, that's enough of that, so let's look at one type of electric lighting that existed before Edison, before Swan, and before everyone else that experimented with filament-based light bulbs. I have in front of me two carbon rods, used as the material of choice because carbon has the highest temperature resistance of any conductive material known in the 1800s. Attached to these rods by copper wires is a powerful source of electricity, in my case, an electric arc welder. Before Edison, one method of electrical illumination worked like this. Woo! <laughs> as you can imagine, there are some downsides to using this as a light source in your home. This consumes tremendous amounts of electricity, and the carbon rods are constantly being eroded away as the spark jumps across them. There's a danger of electrocution, and to top it off, it emits ultraviolet light, which will make you go blind. But it certainly is bright. There were predecessors to both Edison and Swan that had realized the potential of light generation by means of incandescence rather than an electric arc. Edison purchased a patent from a pair of Canadian inventors who were experimenting with taking a carbon rod like this one and shaving it to be thin in the middle so that when electricity was passed through the rod, the thin portion glowed. The main breakthrough from this patent was that the emission of light was improved when the carbon rod was made narrower and longer to increase its electrical resistance. Still, they were a long way off from a mass-producible design, and the attempts to increase the electrical resistance of these carbon rods were not good enough. Carbon is very fragile, and narrowing the rods further caused them to break. The design as it was required way too much power for too little light. In my case, I'm still powering this with my arc welder, using much more power than would have been practical to deliver to a home in the 1800s. In order to make a carbon wire narrow enough to offer adequate electrical resistance, it became apparent that it would need to start that way, rather than being whittled down from a larger carbon rod. Forming a narrow piece of carbon, which is now referred to as a filament, is relatively easy if you start with natural fibers from plants. When plant material is heated to the point of combustion in a closed container where no oxygen can reach it, everything except the carbon turns into a gas, leaving a blackened skeleton of pure carbon behind. The carbon resembles the shape of whatever plant material it came from, meaning if you start with narrow pieces of plant material, you'll end up with narrow pieces of carbon. 
Edison and Swan began experimenting with this concept to create their carbon filaments at approximately the same time. One difficulty with this process is that these filaments are extremely fragile, and it's not easy to connect them to a piece of wire to supply electricity. The carbon is too fragile to hold in a clamp, and the usual methods of joining metals together don't work with carbon. To make a secure electrical connection, it was found that the plant fibers that would form the filaments needed to be joined to the supporting wires that hold them in the center of the light bulb before they were put into the furnace and carbonized. A putty made of tar and carbon soot is used as a glue to hold the filaments to the wires, and since this putty is itself an organic material, it also solidifies into pure carbon. This lump of carbon at either end of the filament bridges the gap and makes a solid physical and electrical connection between the metal wires and the fragile carbon conductor. Before we go any further in this video, I want to take just a minute to talk about this video's sponsor. I've been working with Brilliant for a number of years to help people get a better education with online learning. If you've heard me talk about Brilliant before, you know they're a website and app to help you learn about math, science, and computer science with interactive courses that keep you engaged with puzzles and problem solving. I've actually just learned that they have some content in their scientific thinking course about electric circuits and specifically how different circuits affect the brightness of light bulbs. It's perfect, exactly the thing I'm dealing with in this video. I quickly went through this part of the course and actually learned a few things I did not know that might have helped with this project. Serves me right for not checking Brilliant beforehand. If you'd like to try Brilliant, use my link in the video description below, brilliant.org forward slash Nighthawk, and you can get 20% off a premium membership if you're one of the first 200 subscribers. With that, let's get back in the workshop. Good timing, Moe's. In my own attempts to test many different kinds of filaments, I found it necessary to make a stand with a removable glass dome, since the process of blowing a new glass bulb for every test seemed rather daunting. I use two copper nails pressed into an insulating piece of ceramic to hold the organic filaments in place for carbonization, and carbon putty to glue the filaments to the nails. These pieces of ceramic tile give the filaments a rigid support structure, so I have something solid to grab onto as they're moved in and out of the carbonization chamber. For this test, I'll be using twisted pieces of paper towel as my filament. One thing that Edison discovered rather quickly is that the conductivity of a filament made from pure natural fibers was very low so it had to be helped along by smearing the material before carbonization with some of the same carbon, soot, and tar putty. That's what I've done to this paper towel. I've made my carbonizing chamber in such a way that I can produce about half a dozen test filaments at a time. They're placed upside down on a supporting wire, and then some sacrificial pieces of paper are placed in the chamber with them. So if any oxygen gets in during heating, Hopefully this paper will react with it before it has a chance to damage the filaments. I use a large soup can as the actual carbonizing chamber, and I found that spraying the inside of this can with rubbing alcohol also helped to improve the quality of the filaments by reacting with the oxygen that would otherwise damage them. The heating process takes about 10 or 15 minutes, and then just as long to cool down before I can safely open the chamber and inspect the result. You can see how fragile these filaments are, which is why the ceramic base was necessary to move them around for my testing. Each filament is carefully taken out of the carbonizing chamber and moved over to my test stand where it sits on two exposed pieces of copper, which makes contact with the nails that are glued with carbon putty into the ceramic support and to the now carbonized filament. There's one last thing to do before connecting the power. The filament needs to be protected from oxygen so that it doesn't catch fire and burn away the instant it's turned on. There are a few ways to do this. Edison and Swan's predecessors most often chose to fill the glass bulb with an inert gas, like nitrogen. But Edison found this wasn't ideal for the longevity of the filament. In his eventual patent of a successful light bulb, he wrote this. 
The use of a gas in the receiver, speaking of the light bulb, at atmospheric pressure, although not attacking the carbon, serves to destroy it in time by air washing, or the attrition produced by the rapid passage of the air over the slightly coherent, highly heated surface of the carbon. To put this in simpler terms, Edison believed that the convection inside the bulb caused by the hot filament made even inert gases slowly strip away the carbon by smashing into it. So Edison opted to remove the oxygen from his bulbs with a vacuum pump. And to do this effectively, he had to build a very good one. Now I tried using vacuum to protect my filaments, but my vacuum pumps are not capable of the ultra low pressures achieved by Edison. In fact, that was one of his biggest contributions to science at the time. My filaments quickly burned up in tests with vacuum. Since I don't need my bulbs to last for hundreds of hours for the purpose of this video, I chose a simpler method, which is to fill my bulbs with a gas that would react with oxygen even more easily than my carbon filament, propane. If I inject propane into my bulb, when the filament heats up, any oxygen left inside should prefer to burn with the propane leaving the carbon untouched. My bulbs won't last as long as Edison's due to the air washing effect he mentions, but otherwise they should work for long enough to demonstrate a successful result. With that, let's turn the power on. This light bulb might not look like much when it's surrounded by all my video lights, but in the dark it's bright enough to read by, which is not that far behind the first generation of electric lighting. One of the key goals for a successful light bulb was to have a high enough electrical resistance that it uses only a small amount of power in return for a lot of light. In this respect, my bulb is still a failure. The light is quite dim, paling in comparison to this modern light bulb, which is not just here so I could show the contrast. I'm using this light bulb wired in series with my test platform so that it acts like a resistor to limit the flow of electricity. If I did not have this modern light bulb limiting the flow of electricity, the carbon filament would draw enough power to blow every fuse in my workshop. Let's try it. I'll disconnect the power and remove the light bulb from my test platform. To reconnect the circuit, I'll instead put a 15 amp fuse in the socket, which will hopefully blow before my main workshop fuses. But until then, it should allow my test bulb to draw as much power as it wants. So let's see what happens. We were able to get a lot of light out of the bulb for just a moment, but at a cost of way too much power and way too much heat for the filament to handle. So the bulb burnt out. And here we have reached the main difference between the light bulbs made by Edison and those made by Joseph Swan. This light bulb that I have created is much like a Swan light bulb in functionality. It requires multiple bulbs to be wired in series so that each one does not draw too much power. This is what Swan's light bulbs also required. It's a much bigger challenge to create a filament that has enough electrical resistance that it can stand alone on a circuit, being plugged directly into a power grid. Edison's company was not only inventing a light bulb, at this same time they were also working on designing the electrical grid that could power them. Swan's first patented light bulbs did not take this into account, and for this reason were just not practical on a large scale. Plugging one in in the wrong configuration could cause a blackout or burn down your house as it draws too much power for the wiring. There are solutions around these problems, but the best one is to just make a better light bulb. In the second paragraph of Edison's patent, we can see that the intention was not just to invent another electric light, which could work in the lab or on a small scale, and which Swan and others had already accomplished, but to invent a light that could function in a real-world application of a power grid. And this is where it gets very complicated. To make a filament that has greater electrical resistance, there are two ways to go about it. You can make the filament longer, or you can make it narrower. In both cases, they become much more fragile and more difficult to work with. 
I experimented with dozens, maybe more than a hundred different types of filaments and methods to make them, including making spiral filaments, which come with a whole host of new challenges with preventing the distortion of the coil. All this with no great success. When the filaments get much longer than what I've already demonstrated, it takes much more voltage to overcome their initial resistance the first time power passes through them. After this first burn-in, the resistance greatly drops, as I believe the extreme heat actually converts the filament into a much more conductive form of carbon, graphite. Reaching this point for short filaments can be done with the 115 volts from my wall outlet, but to go any further and make light bulbs comparable to Edison's, I think I would need a higher voltage power supply to provide the initial kick. So this is where I stand on this project. I've had the best success with filaments made from cotton string, paper, and paper towel. Cotton string and paper are both mentioned in Edison's first patent. The results, though, are roughly equivalent to Joseph Swan-style light bulbs. Edison's best results were with bamboo, specifically bamboo that had been aged 10 years or more. I've had difficulty with this because all the samples of bamboo that I could find were not flexible enough to form tightly curved filaments, even after I tried steam bending and a few other bending methods. This has definitely given me a new respect for the invention of electric lighting. Edison's patent in particular is densely packed with an entire series of small but brilliant discoveries that all come together in the eventual assembly of a completed light bulb. Whether he was personally responsible for most of these discoveries, or if they are the result of those he hired, the finished product, a working carbon filament light bulb with high and consistent electrical resistance, is an impressive accomplishment. Hopefully you've gotten a small taste of that from this video. Leave me comments below, I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for watching, I'll see you next time.